Fair Kerala. Pan Africanism, the idea that peoples of African descent have common interests and should be unified. Historically, Pan Africanism has often taken the shape of a political or cultural movement. There are many varieties of Pan Africanism. In its narrowest political manifestation, Pan Africanists envision a unified African nation where all people of the African diaspora can live. African diaspora refers to the long term historical process by which people of African descent have been scattered from their ancestral homelands to other parts of the world. In more general terms, Pan Africanism is the sentiment that people of African descent have a great deal in common, a fact that deserves notice and even celebration. History of Pan Africanist Intellectuals Pan Africanist ideas first began to circulate in the mid 19th century in the United States, led by Africans from the Western Hemisphere. The most important early Pan Africanists were Martin Delaney and Alexander Crummel, both African Americans, and Edward Blyden, a West Indian. Those early voices for Pan Africanism emphasized the commonalities between Africans and black people in the United States. Delaney, who believed that black people could not prosper alongside whites, advocated the idea that African Americans should separate from the United States and establish their own nation. Crummel and Blyden, both contemporaries of Delaney, thought that Africa was the best place for that new nation. Motivated by Christian missionary zeal, the two believed that Africans in the New World should return to their homelands and convert and civilize the inhabitants there. Although the ideas of Delaney, Crummel, and Blyden are important, the true father of modern Pan-Africanism was the influential thinker W.E.B. Dubois. Throughout his long career, Dubois was a consistent advocate for the study of African history and culture. In the early 20th century, he was most prominent among the few scholars who studied Africa. His statement, made at the turn of the 20th century, that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line was made with Pan-Africanist sentiments in mind. For Dubois, the problem of the color line was not confined merely to the United States and its Negro problem. During those years, it was common for many in the United States to refer to the problem of African Americans' social status as the Negro problem. Dubois' famous statement was made with the clear knowledge that many Africans living on the African continent suffered under the yoke of European colonial rule. Among the more important Pan-Africanist thinkers of the first decades of the 20th century was Jamaican-born black nationalist Marcus Garvey. In the years after World War I, Garvey championed the cause of African independence, emphasizing the positive attributes of black people's collective past. His organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, boasted millions of members, envisioning and then making plans for a return back to Africa. Garvey's Black Star Line, a shipping company established in part to transport blacks back to Africa as well as to facilitate global black commerce, was ultimately unsuccessful. Get a Britannica premium subscription and gain access to exclusive content. Subscribe now. From the 1920s through the 1940s, among the most prominent black intellectuals who advocated Pan-Africanist ideas were C.L.R. James and George Padmore, both of whom came from Trinidad. From the 1930s until his death in 1959, Padmore was one of the leading theorists of Pan-African ideas. Also influential were Leopold Sanger and M. Césaire, who were natives of Senegal and Martinique, respectively. A disciple of Padmore, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, was also an important figure in Pan-Africanist thought. Despite their origins outside the United States, such Pan-Africanist thinkers drew many of their ideas from African-American culture. Furthermore, James and Padmore resided in the United States for significant periods of time. An exchange of ideas about Africa and peoples of African descent took place between those intellectuals and African Americans, with African Americans taking the lead. It was, in many ways, a black Atlantic intellectual community. Sanger and Césaire, in particular, were greatly influenced by Dubois and by several Harlem Renaissance writers, 
especially County Cullen, Langston Hughes, and Claude McKay. In the 1930s and 40s, the African-American actor and singer Paul Robeson was also a significant contributor to the continuing exchange of ideas. By the late 1940s the African-American intellectual leadership of the movement had receded, with Africans now taking the lead. That was due in part to the leftist or communist sympathies of many pan-Africanist advocates, as in the late 1940s and early 50s, the United States was in the midst of a Red Scare, when Americans with communist affiliations or sympathies were actively persecuted and prosecuted. The most important figure of this period was Kwame Krumah of Ghana, who believed that European colonial rule of Africa could be extinguished if Africans could unite politically and economically. Kruma went on to lead the movement for independence in Ghana, which came to fruition in 1957. Many African Americans cheered those developments in Africa. Pan-Africanist cultural thinking re-emerged with renewed force in the United States in the late 1960s and 70s as one of the manifestations of the Black Power movement. By the early 1970s it had become relatively common for African Americans to investigate their African cultural roots and adopt African forms of cultural practice, especially African styles of dress. In subsequent decades, perhaps the most prominent current of ideas that can be called pan-Africanist has been the Afrocentric movement, as espoused by such black intellectuals as Molafai Asante of Temple University, Chaik Anta Diop of Senegal, the American historian Carter G. Woodson, and Maulana Ron Karenga, the creator of Kwanzaa. With its roots in the 1960s, Afrocentrism gained particular popularity in the United States during the 1980s. The movement emphasizes African modes of thought and culture as a corrective to the long tradition of European cultural and intellectual domination. The Pan-African Congress Movement During the 20th century advocates of Pan-Africanism made many efforts to institutionalize their ideas and to create formal organizations to complement the work of Pan-Africanist intellectuals. The first meeting designed to bring together peoples of African descent for the purpose of discussing Pan-Africanist ideas took place in London in 1900. The organizer was Henry Sylvester Williams, a native of Trinidad. The meeting was attended by several prominent blacks from Africa, Great Britain, the West Indies, and the United States. Dubois was perhaps the most prominent member of U.S. delegation. The first formal Pan-African Congress, the first to bear that name, took place in 1919 in Paris and was called by Dubois. That meeting was followed by a second Pan-African Congress two years later, which convened in three sessions in London, Brussels, and Paris. The most important result of the second Pan-African Congress was the issuance of a declaration that criticized European colonial domination in Africa and lamented the unequal state of relations between white and black races, calling for a fairer distribution of the world's resources. The declaration also challenged the rest of the world to either create conditions of equality in the places where people of African descent lived or recognize the rise of a great African state founded in peace and goodwill. After a third Pan-African Congress in 1923 and then a fourth in 1927, the movement faded from the world picture until 1945 when a fifth Pan-African Congress was held in Manchester, England. Given that Pan-Africanist leadership had largely transferred from African Americans to Africans by the mid-1940s, Kruma, Kenyatta, and Padmore played the most prominent roles at that Congress. The only African American present was Dubois. With the coming of independence for many African countries in the decades following World War II, the cause of African unity was largely confined to the concerns of the African continent. The formation of the Organization for African Unity, OAU, in 1963 solidified African leadership, although a sixth Pan-African Congress was held in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, in 1974. A successor organization to the OAU, the African Union, AU, was launched in 2002 to further promote the social, political, and economic integration of Africa.
calls for Pan-Africanism could still be heard in the United States at the turn of the 21st century, but by then the movement had generally come to stand for the unity of the countries on the African continent, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. Africa. Peter Curilla, the editors of Encyclopedia Britannica. Paul Cuff. Table of Contents. Paul Cuff, original name Paul Slocum, Cuff also spelled Cuffy, born January 17, 1759, Cuddy Hunk Island, Massachusetts, U.S., died September 7, 1817, Westport, Massachusetts, U.S., American shipowner, merchant, and Pan-Africanist who was an influential figure in the 19th century movement to resettle free black Americans to Africa. He was one of ten children born to Kofi, or Cuff, Slocum, a freed slave, and Ruth Moses, a Native American of the Wampanoag tribe. Kofi, a skilled carpenter who gained his freedom in 1745, raised his family on a farm in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. After Kofi's death in 1772, Paul took his father's first name as his surname. Upon coming of age, he went to sea, and during the American Revolution he served on a privateer and often participated in running American supplies through British blockades. In 1783 he married a Native American woman named Alice Pequit, and the couple eventually had seven children. After the war's end, Cuff and his brother-in-law, Michael Wayner, opened a shipyard, and they soon had three small ships. Cuff would later build a number of larger vessels, including the Hero and the Alpha. He and various relatives manned the ships and went on long whaling expeditions and trading voyages to Europe and other parts of the Americas. In addition to his maritime ventures, Cuff was a prosperous merchant as well as the owner of a grist mill and a farm. As a result of his labors, Cuff was perhaps the wealthiest African American of his time. Despite his financial success, Cuff was keenly aware of the inequities and difficulties faced by blacks in the United States. In the late 1770s Paul and his brother John Cuff refused to pay taxes, arguing that, despite being free blacks, they were denied the right to vote. The two were briefly jailed and in 1780 Cuff and several other free blacks petitioned the Massachusetts General Court, requesting that they be exempted from taxation because they were denied the benefits of citizenship. The result was that Massachusetts passed a law making all free persons of color liable to taxation, according to the ratio established for white men and granting them the privileges belonging to the other citizens. In 1808 Cuff became a member of the Society of Friends, Quakers, and he joined the Friends meeting in nearby Westport, Massachusetts, where he bought a farm. Asked by the Society to assist in the resettlement of free blacks to the British colony of Sierra Leone, Cuff became interested in the possibility of freed slaves returning to Africa. He thus embarked on efforts to establish settlements on Africa's west coast and to develop trade routes to the area. In 1811 he founded the Friendly Society of Sierra Leone and subsequently sailed there. Later that year he journeyed to England, where he met with British abolitionists and sought support for his resettlement plans, he eventually secured a land grant. In 1812 Cuff returned to the United States, at which time his cargo was seized on charges that he broke the 1807 Embargo Act, which restricted imports from Great Britain. Cuff traveled to Washington, D.C., where he met with U.S. President James Madison, who ordered the release of his cargo. Cuff continued to advocate for his colonization plans, and he initially gained support from a number of African-American leaders. In December 1815 Cuff and 38 black settlers sailed for Sierra Leone, and they landed in February 1816. He returned to the United States later that year and sought backing for another voyage.
However, his health soon began to decline, and he died the following year. He wrote Memoir of Captain Paul Cuffey, 1811. Get a Britannica premium subscription and gain access to exclusive content. Subscribe now this article was most recently revised and updated by Amy Tikkanen. Collectivism Table of Co